welcome to Talk With History. I am your host, Scott, here with my wife and historian, Jen. Hello. On this podcast, we give you insights to our history-inspired world travels, YouTube channel journey, and examine history through deeper conversations with the curious, the explorers, and the history lovers out there. Now, Jen, before we get into our main topic, I want to put in a plug for some podcast reviews. We have I haven't asked for any podcast reviews for a while. And my my Spotify five star count for the podcast is slowly increasing. So for my Spotify listeners and my Apple podcast listeners, you can't let the other one catch up. So if you're listening on Apple, don't let the Spotify folks catch up. But if you're listening on Spotify, try to catch up to the Apple Podcast um, reviews. We've got thirty plus. You know, oh, nice. so we're doing well on the Apple podcast side. We are only about, let me see here. I think we're only about 3,650 reviews away from catching the History Channel. Oh, they have pod- a podcast. podcast. Oh, They've wow. got like a history this week. We got about 3,700 reviews. So we're only, you know, you know, not too far behind, only a couple thousand. Do they actually talk about history? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no clue. I just looked it up because I think it's funny. They have about 3,700. If you're listening, even if you're listening for the first time, leave us a review. It really helps us out. Today, we're venturing to the hollowed grounds of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in July of 1863. The heart of the brutal battle of Gettysburg. But we're not focusing on the generals and the grand maneuvers. In this episode, we delve into the lives of remarkable women who were caught in the maelstrom of the Battle of Gettysburg. We'll meet Elizabeth Thorne, a local resident who housed generals, buried many dead and all while six months pregnant. And there was Jenny Wade, the only civilian casualty at Gettysburg. Yes, the only one. Her story serving as a stark reminder of the war's human cost. But these are just two names. Many women played crucial yet often overlooked roles during the Civil War, from tending to the injured to gathering intelligence. They shouldered enormous burdens and displayed immense courage. So join us as we explore the experience of these extraordinary women and discover how they shaped the course of history at Gettysburg and beyond. Jen. So we did a trip up to Gettysburg in yeah. a gorgeous time of the year in October. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Best Gr- time. Best to time to go. It was like right around Halloween. It was mm-hmm. packed. It was packed. A ton of people there. But we focused on something a little different this time. Yeah. I wanted to talk about the women of Gettysburg. So I want people to, for me, I like to kind of, how do I remember things? Gettysburg, always think of the middle of the Civil War. It happens 1863, so smack in the middle between 1861 and 1865, and it happens in July. So it's the middle of the year. So middle, it's really like the middle battle. So everybody kind of knows what's going on. Nobody really knows where the end, if the end is in sight. Yeah, so this is really, really the South has a lot of momentum. They're pushing north, right? No one realizes that this is going to be the turning point, but it will be because this is the South is coming really into Northern Territory now, getting close to D.C., getting close to just coming into the the Northern Territory. And Elizabeth Thorne is an immigrant. She she was born in December of 1832. And I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, but it's kind of funny. Grand Duchy of Hesse. Yeah. <laughs> Germany. And so her parents are both immigrants. She's immigrated. Little's no, little is known about her early life, but they settle in Gettysburg. And she marries another German immigrant, Peter Thorne. In her husband becomes caretaker of Evergreen Cemetery. Evergreen Cemetery has just started. It, it's established in 1855. This is February of 1856 that he becomes caretaker. And we know Evergreen Cemetery today because it's near the national cemetery out there it's and right beside it it shares it shares a with like a, a wall not even it's just like, like, a, like a fence line but it's, yeah. it's right there across from battlegrounds it's right smack in the middle of the where yeah, the battle cemetery happened. hill when yeah. you hear cemetery hill at gettysburg they're talking about evergreen cemetery yeah and we show actually on our video 
we're standing at the sign for Evergreen Cemetery. We look across the street and literally across the street is Cemetery Hill. Yes. And significantly, we'll talk about it, but this is where Lincoln will actually stand in Evergreen Cemetery when he delivers the Gettysburg Address. So because he's dedicating that national cemetery, which they share a fence. They're, they border each other. Right. That was not there then. So you can imagine that was just all. Yeah. She marries Peter Thorne, 1855, 1856. He becomes caretaker of Evergreen Cemetery. What's a caretaker? It's a grave digger. Basically, it's a person who you bring the body to. They they find the plot. You know, they take care of the graves there. They basically is just like a, a maintenance person for the cemetery. But he lives there with Elizabeth, her parents who speak German and they have three boys, they're young boys, and she's pregnant with her fourth. When Peter joins the 138th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment, and he leaves her in charge of the cemetery. And so when the Union troops start to come into Gettysburg, that's when she gets the knock on the door from General Howard asking her what roads lead into or he has to talk to the man of the house because this is 1863 and he figures a man's going to know the roads and a woman won't know much at all but the man of the house doesn't speak english yeah that's right because you said her her father lived there and he only speaks german only speaks german right so she takes him out six months pregnant up on the hill and shows him the three made roads coming into gettysburg and if he wants to get troops, these are the main roads that come into this little town. It's a little town of people. And he says, okay, thank you. You should probably leave there. We know that there's a lot of Southern troops here. We're bringing in a lot of Northern troops here and there's going to be a fight. And because I see you have elderly parents, three young boys, and you're pregnant, you should probably leave. And they have a farm on the outskirts of town. So they, they leave. And, they don't come back until July 7th. So after after the battle. After the battle. I would say four days after the battle. Yeah. And by the time they get back to their house, the caretaker house, which we show in the video, it's ransacked. Because you can imagine these men are looking for food, they're looking for anything they can use. And it was used as a makeshift hospital because it's right there. It's a, it's a brick and mortar home right there by where a lot of fighting took place. Yeah, it's on the outskirts of this, the city now. But it's at the heart of kind of where everything was happening. Yeah. It's right between the city and the visitor center. Yeah. So it's very easy to find. And so by the time she gets back, it's okay. Now what do I do? I have to, you know, take care of these young boys. I have to get my parents settled. I have to kind of find food. And oh, by the way, she gets another knock at the door. There's thousands of dead men out in fields just laying there. And we need to bury these men. So the statue depicted of her in Evergreen Cemetery is her kind of wiping her brow, six months pregnant with a shovel, because she digs uh, over 100 graves by herself. And you'd think graves, I'm talking six feet, graves. Like she's digging graves. Yeah, it, it was interesting being there, right? One being at Gettysburg in the fall, the leaves changing. It was, it was just gorgeous. Weather was amazing. Yes. But the, the statue itself is so unique because she is pregnant, mm-hmm. right? They show her, like they're displaying her, you know, six months pregnant. So like she looks like she, she's ready to give birth. Yeah. And here she is wiping her brow, holding a shovel in her hand. It was just, it's such a unique statue it was really neat to just go there and be in this beautiful location and see what this amazing woman did. Yeah, and there's no true number. Estimates are as low as 91 to 100, as high as 105. So I would say about 100 graves she she dug on her own. And I'm sure she helped. More. And planned. I'm yeah. sure she helped plan. I'm hope she, I'm sure she helped. This is where we should put these people. These ways we should put these people. This is, and then with the national cemetery starting, at first they buried men out on the battlefield where they lay. Oh, I didn't know that. And then when they started to start the national cemetery, they dug them up and started to bring them into the national cemetery. And then they also repatriated Confederates back to where yeah. they should be. Yeah, and I think you you would even mention that even in Evergreen Cemetery, there was families that would come and mm-hmm. retrieve you know, the buried bodies, you know, yes. of their family member and bring it home. And I think there's still some Confederates in the National Cemetery because they they weren't sure if they got everybody. But when we went to 
Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. In Richmond, that's where I think most of the, the Gettysburg Confederates are. Oh yes, because there's mm-hmm. that big kind of monument there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so she helped plan all of that, right? And so you really think this woman, again, knowing the language, big battle, dead men, and what she did too was she like gave each man dignity and respect in their burial. She helped, you know, lay them to rest in a peaceful manner, knowing that they were someone's husband or brother or son or uncle. Like she was just very respectful of them as a caretaker's wife. She already understands the process, helping to identify these men. Most of them are traveling with pictures or something on them, pulling those items from them and then probably serializing them, identifying them. Well, and she's doing this in the heat of July. July. In- you know, it's so d- depending on the kind of summer, it was, she, I mean, she's sweating her, her, her butt off. And I think you even mentioned in the video, and again, the, the link to this video, if you guys want to see the location, will, will be in the show notes of this podcast. But you mentioned that she wore the same dress for, was it six weeks or something? It was, yeah. it was quite a while. It was quite a while. We'll go- Maybe not six weeks, but because she would probably- be giving birth, you know, in that time. But yeah, she wore the same dress the entire time. Yeah. Because she just didn't have the time to a probably make a bigger dress. And she didn't want to use other dresses for all this dirty work she's doing. you probably wear your pregnancy dress when you think about it. Uh, On November 1st, she'll give birth to a daughter. So after having three sons, she has a daughter named Rose Mead Thorne in honor of General George Mead, who commanded the Army of the Potomac there at Gettysburg. She remained caretaker until her husband returned safely from war in 1865. So it's not like he came right back either. She was doing this for another a year and a half until he came home giving birth. It's just amazing to me. Uh, he, they remain on and he resigns as caretaker in 1874. So nine years later. So you can imagine she gives birth in November. Lincoln comes out mid-November to give the Gettysburg Address. Was it that same year? Same year, okay. 1863. So she's probably helping, she's caretaker of the cemetery, set up the stage, yeah. set up the podium yeah. in my she, cemetery. She's probably setting all that stuff up. Because he stood in Evergreen Cemetery and looked over into what was now the new National Cemetery. And so she's caretaker, so she knows all of these logistics. Yeah. So she's probably with a newborn planning all of this so this woman is just she's the unsung hero of gettysburg i just wanted to give her some credit uh she'll die october 17th 1907 at age 74 her her and her husband are both buried at evergreen cemetery yeah so we visit their graves in the video as well yeah that was that was pretty neat and then from there so she's kind of She's a, she's kind of a I'll say a historical character at the be- beginning the very before the battle ever starts and then obviously afterwards right the the, the death afterwards is kind yes. of what I, I put on the thumbnail but Jenny Wade is someone who who's significant kind of for what happened during the battle. Yeah, so Jenny Wade is most people will know that name. The Jenny Wade House is a very tourist location for Gettysburg. And, and if I remember right, her her real her full name is Virginia Wade. Mary Virginia Wade. Mary Virginia Wade. She's born May twenty first, eighteen forty three. She's twenty years old, but she is the only direct civilian casualty of the battle. So there are people who will die after the battle from injuries they sustained during the battle who were okay. civilians. But she's the only direct civilian casualty during the battle. Which is kind of mind boggling when, you know, Gettysburg is, is famous for a reason, right? Turning point of the Civil War, but also yeah. th- there's a lot that happened there. Yeah, all the men that died. Yeah. It's a lot. I think it's 40,000 men died. Um, yeah. And only one, and to, to think that only one civilian died during the battle and it was her. Yeah, 50,000 men died. 23,000 Union, 28,000 Confederates, and only one civilian died. And it was a woman. That's insane. And especially if you go to Gettysburg and you, like, but you should go. It's fantastic. And yeah. go in the fall because it's so much fun. 
in the center of the city where the Jenny Wade house is, is really where this crossroads of battle was taking place. As again, you're kind of Cemetery Hills behind you. What we just talked about, Elizabeth Thorne is behind you. And in front of you would be the Confederates and Jenny Wade's house, which is really her sister's house. Right smack in the middle. Right smack in the middle. So they're taking gunfire at home as they're, as they're going about their business in the house. And this is happening to a lot of families in the area because the battle just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't happen there. That's the first day. But as, it, as you move around the next two days, it moves around the city of Gettysburg and other houses get in their crossfire and other barns and other people. So this, there, there's bullet holes even today in the buildings of Gettysburg. There's cannonballs in the buildings of Gettysburg. So to, for her to be the only casualty what? is really crazy and and the crazy part too and again we kind of show this in, in the in the video is it goes through through an outside door mm-hmm. and then an in, inner door and then into her yeah and so they say 150 bullets hit that house that's crazy so what what's going on is jenny wade again is 20 years old her sister lives at that house it's 548 baltimore street and her sister george anna known as georgie had became engaged before the war, married her sweetheart, 1862. They moved into that two-story brick house, 548 Baltimore Street. And her husband had joined the Union Army and was not in Gettysburg during the battle. And he was also absent of the birth of their firstborn. And the boy was born June 26th, 1863. And so four days after the birth is when people are riding into Gettysburg and it's, the war is starting. And so Jenny Wade's mother decides we should go and stay with your sister. To help her out. To help her out since she just had a baby. Because they lived in the center of Gettysburg, which they probably would have been behind the fire. Further away from the battle. Further away from the battle. So they go to the house and they help. And at the time, she's making bread. She's kneading dough for loaves of bread. And that's again, why people think of the, the chivalry. Of she was what doing, she's doing that for, for the soldiers. She was doing that for the soldiers, yeah. which is what women in their capacity really did at the time. Because again, these soldiers are, are traveling bare bones, what they can carry on them, and food is scarce, and they really scavenger for food. And so when they are able to find a place where people are providing sustenance for them, women really take it as their duty to perform that. Yeah, and and you hear about the the rare occasions, the the Clara Bartons, you know, that mm-hmm. started the Red Cross and was kind of one of the first kind of nurses on the battlefield, you know, in, in in this kind of setting. But like you said, the vast majority of what women did and knew how to do and and actively did throughout the war was provide whatever sustenance they could mm-hmm. for the men who were fighting. And she, from what I read, that dough that she was kneading when the bullet went through the door went through another door, hit her through the shoulder into her heart and killed her instantly. Her mother then baked 14 loaves of bread with that dough and still made that that dough for the soldiers because that's what she would have wanted. Wow. Uh, A bullet flew through the window of the house and hit a bedpost while Georgiana was in bed lying with her baby. And that's why they moved into the basement. She woke early that day. This happened the morning of July 3rd. So kind of like towards the end of the mm-hmm. battle. Yes. So 8 a.m. July 3rd. The first day it was when 150 bullets hit the house. 8 a.m. July 3rd, she was kneading the bread. And that's when the bullet through the two closed doors hit her in the shoulder, lodged itself in her heart, and got trapped in her body by the corset she was wearing. And she died instantly. And the dough that she was kneading at the time of her death was baked into bread by her mother and made 15 loaves. Union soldiers helped wrap her body in a quilt and either brought her to the cellar or buried her in the backyard immediately. So we show the backyard in the video. Yeah. She was moved to the town's German church in November of 1865. Her body was eventually moved to Evergreen Cemetery, the same cemetery that Elizabeth Thorne is the caretaker for. And that and that was one of the ones that had, you know, quite a unique kind of distinction at her her little monument memorial that was in the cemetery. Yeah, in 1900 with tireless efforts from her family and the women in the area, they were able to get a large and have the perpetual American flag. And like talk about it's one of the only two sites in America besides the Betty Ross, Betsy Ross house 
that perpetually flies an American flag in honor of a woman. Yeah, I thought that was really neat because we see the American flag flying consistently over many grave sites. But when you have that kind of distinction recognized for something, you know, that a woman is doing when women couldn't and didn't really serve in battle, but they they did serve in whatever capacity they could, seeing that recognized was really cool. Yeah, and she had a sweetheart at the time who was also fighting in the in the cause for the union. She was carrying his picture. His name was Jack uh, Sh- Skelly, and she, he dies from wounds he sustained in the battle in June of 1863, and he dies nine days after she dies. Okay. They're buried close to each other in Evergreen Cemetery, so you can find Jack Shelley's grave as well. And if you go to the Jenny Wade house, there's artifacts of the letters they wrote each other and stuff and things along that nature with their courtship. There's other women at the time who are doing, who are making bread and being very brave. I want to recognize like Elizabeth Thorne and Jenny Wade are the two big stories that we know of women at Gettysburg, but know that there were fighters there were seven women who were wounded in Gettysburg as as soldiers. Oh, wow. And they were only found out later. But the, the sex was revealed later when they were given treatment. There were seven POWs who were women. And again, only found out later. Nine died on the battlefield as soldiers. So when you think about it, there's about 20 women who are disguising themselves as soldiers fighting and people were asked well why did women do that at the time and i'm not sure of all you know what each individual was thinking but really it was a really a duty and money well as as kind of an all hands all hands on deck you know as we say in the navy kind of scenario i mean women were doing that from the very get-go when we talked about the battle of manassas Mm -hmm. there were women doing the exact same thing then yes and sometimes you needed the money for your family Sometimes there were no boys and your family needed something to survive. And we always talk about when immigrants came off the boats to America, they were signing them up for the Civil War right there. Come sign up, go fight for your country. And they were handing them uniforms and and rifles right then and guaranteeing them a paycheck, which was huge coming to America with no understanding of even maybe the language or how the commerce is working. So that is huge. So as a woman to be able to make that money disguised as a man, that's one of one of the reasons why women did it. Again, duty was another. And some were fighting beside their husbands. Some took up arms when their husbands, you know, got hurt or yeah. but it's just interesting to know that there there are women who are participating in the Battle of Gettysburg in pretty much every capacity. We just want to honor Elizabeth Thorne and Jenny Wade in all of those women's memory. Yeah. And women who were kind of playing playing that that more supporting role. It was it was really incredible. And if you can ever go to Gettysburg in October, do it because it is it's beautiful. It's it's a blast. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talk with History. We've explored the remarkable stories of women like Elizabeth Thorne and Jenny Wade, but their experiences represent countless others who played vital roles during the Civil War. These women served as nurses, cooks, spies, and so much more. Their bravery, resilience, and unwavering determination in the face of wartime hardship deserve our recognition. Thank you for listening to Talk With History Podcast. And please reach out to us at our website, talkwithhistory.com. But more importantly, if you know someone else that might enjoy this podcast, please share it with them. Shoot them a text and tell them to look us up. We rely on you, our community, to grow. And we appreciate you all every day. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you.